that the, the reason they had to murder him is that John McAfee on the loose in the United States, even if it's because he's in a jail cell, but he's in the United States, and he's got Mark, a credible third party, is an author telling his story. They couldn't allow that. Ladies and gentlemen, joining us tonight, best-selling Scottish author and co-writer Mark Eglinton joins us. His recent books include Blindsided with former Australian rugby captain and stroke survival stroke survivor Michael Linog. By the way, um, I, this is a chance that, that for, for Mark uh, and, and well, me and Joey to explore a little bit more of, of Mark's catalog. And as a former rugby player myself, I'm pretty excited about that. Uh, but that was uh, shortlisted for International Autobiography of the Year in 2016, Heavy Duty Days and Nights in Jews Priest with musician K.K. Downing. And George all like, yes, yeah. that's what I want to talk about. One of Rolling Stone's 10 music books of 2018 and most recently reboot my life, my life, my time with football legend Michael Owen. Um, also shortlisted for Autobiography of the Year in 2020 by the Daily Telegraph. And uh, I, I recently, uh, so we spoke uh, earlier in the, the process with No Domain, the book about John McAfee, um, my former running mate for the Libertarian Party nomination for president, who was murdered one way or another in a Spanish jail cell uh, while there for tax evasion. Um, and, and we're going to get into that a little bit here with Mark as well now that some time has passed. Uh, but I, I had the, the pleasure recently of listening to the entire audiobook of uh, No Domain while doing chainsaw work out here. And, you know, it, it's, it, 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 it was so powerful uh, for me personally to connect with my friend and to hear his words, so to speak, from beyond the grave. So, Mark, I, I want to thank you for that, really, for, uh, I mean, for what you did doing, doing our, our friend John McAfee justice with, uh, with that book. How are you today, sir? I appreciate it. I, I'm still trying to get over that intro, which was quite lengthy and impressive, and I appreciate it. Uh, yeah, I mean, I appreciate what you said about No Domain because it was people like you that I was really keen to get some kind of feedback from for a lot of different reasons. Uh, one, you knew him. Two, you understand that lifestyle. Uh, you know. <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. Are you accusing me of understanding the John McAfee lifestyle? That's, that's not, a, not a human possible feat, but I, I think I am uniquely appreciative of it. At least. Yeah, you're a lot closer than most. Um, yeah. You know, for, for that reason, it was really important to me. And, you know, I think people going into it didn't really know what to expect. I think a lot of people went in there thinking there was going to be a lot of, uh, well, what I describe as the kind of noise around John. Uh, and there is a lot of noise around John, and a lot of the noise was noise that John created. But that really wasn't the book that we did. The book that we we wanted to do was was the man John McAfee and what it was that motivated him to be the guy he was, what it was he felt, what it was his philosophy and life was. Yeah. And that was stuff that he'd never done before. And hmm. I think he found it really challenging to do it. And uh, there were moments for sure where it kind of felt like he was pulling back from the abyss. Hmm. And I was fine with that because, you know, there's a guy that's lived a life. I was kind of pushing him down different directions, pushing back on stuff in order to try and keep it sane. Because this is something somebody said to me a few times. In fact, one of the reviewers who I really uh, appreciate said, had John been allowed to be turned loose on his own with an autobiography co-written by me, it would have been madness. Because there'd, be, there'd just be absolutely no, uh, there'd be no checks and balances There'd be nobody saying, wait a minute, that is insane. That couldn't have happened. So in the way that this book kind of came to be the, the, the format it's in, I now look back on it and think that was a real 
twist of luck that we ended up doing it like we did because it allowed us to do this kind of back and forth. And I think that actually benefited in a better book than it would have been otherwise. He used you like a therapist. Yeah. Did you? I mean, did you, you got a sense of that as this was going that, that he was that he, he was downloading, he was processing his own life. I don't think. Again, t tell us the, the the timeline over over which this happened and how the project came together again, please. Yeah, I mean, this the first conversation we had was in uh, September of 2019. At that point, John was in hiding wherever that was. I didn't know where that was at the time. That was what was so strange about it. And I contacted him and asked him if he wanted to write an autobiography, because that's what I do. As you introed me there, you know, the work I do is with musicians, with sports people, with business types, etc. And I just wanted to do the same with John. And he was very guarded at the beginning. He was, you know, what's it going to cost me? Who the hell are you? Right. All this shit. And that's fair enough. And it was, there was quite a funny part at the beginning because he said to me, send me a link of some, some of your work or something like that. And that week I just had an interview with a local newspaper, which he'd never heard of. And for some reason I sent him that and he came back to me and said, I don't give a fuck what anyone writes about you. I want to, I want to see your writing. So kind of chastened a little bit by that kind of beat down. I went back and sent him a, a I think I sent him a, several chapters of a book I wrote with a member of the band Pantera. Uh, it was one of the first music yeah. books I ever wrote. That book was intentionally really gritty, really grimy, really kind of hard hitting. And he came back to me straight away and said, you're, you're the guy I want to work with. So John's life, you see, there's something I, I would say that John and I had as, as a kind of a kindred spirits that, I think you were uniquely able to capture being more of a music writer, essentially, right? Because they, there's there's something that I mean, I, I used to tell people, you know, like I want to be John McAfee when I grow up, and that had nothing to do with the money or the tech <laughs> shit. Like, no, I just I want to I want to grow up mentally to be the complete beautiful human being whose life is a song. Yeah. Who's, who's is, is, is an unending improv riff in crescendo. Mm -hmm. And you caught him at such a beautiful time in his life where you were able to, I mean, your, your job, I mean, it's hard to say who gets more credit as the creative mind behind the book, <laughs> no domain, like you or John, because you, you were the vessel, you captured it you know, in, in a very unique way and was you were able to present it and pull out of him as you know, who John needed for a therapist at the end of his life was a music writer who was going to try to pull a biography out of him. And and what you created with that was what, what was the song that was the final note to John McAfee's life beyond I'm not counting, of course, his, his incarceration and murder, um, and, and and I I I, I mean that's that's what I, I that I think that's the best I can do for pitching your book and your work in that sense. I hope that that speaks to you as as the creator. Yeah, yeah, it, it very much does. But you said you said something interesting there. Uh, you said that I call him a beautiful moment. No, that that might be the case, but there's an irony there that he was in a situation that was anything but beautiful at that time. This was a guy who was under quite a lot of duress. And I saw that duress a lot during while we talked because while a lot of the conversations, John was very friendly and very open and very cheerful. There were a good few days where John would, well, <laughs> there was a good few days where he just disappeared. And there was another few days when he was pretty bad tempered and I could tell that there was stuff going on in his life that was nothing to do with what we were talking about. So I think it's the combination of those things. Y your beautiful moment in life, I think, is true in the sense that I think he knew he was pretty near the end of his life. I think he knew this was probably, probably the last opportunity he'd ever have to talk to somebody in this way. But at the same time, he was in a really tough spot. So I think, you know the combination of those forces probably forced him to 
give me the kind of information that I just happen to be there to get out of him. But you know, I, I'll take your I'll take your uh, critique uh, and I'll run with it because uh, <laughs> I really I really appreciate what you're saying. But it's interesting. You talk about music, and we we talked a lot about music, and you know, people call me a music writer. I'm I'm, I'm really not. I just wrote about music right. early, in my, early in my career. And the reason I did it was because I grew up as a metalhead and I'm still a metalhead and I will always be one. And when I wanted to get into writing, the path of least resistance for me was to go to heavy metal. You know, what do you know wow. about? Who, what can you write about? And that's what I could do. And the same applied to sport to a lesser extent. But it, it's really not about the music or the rugby or the soccer or even John McAfee. It's about the people. And I keep people who ask me about what it is I do always ask me the same questions. And it always goes back to the same thing. It is about relating to another person. And it doesn't matter what that other person does. They can do anything. And John McAfee for me was just somebody who did something else. I didn't, yeah. I didn't sort of categorize him as being some, something in any way different from what I'd done before. He was just another person. And I just had to go down the same path I'd done with everybody else, which is get to know you, what makes you what you are, where can we find common ground? And the, and the great thing about John, and sorry to ramble on here, is that I, I've worked with a lot of people who don't actually give a shit about me. Uh, and that's not a criticism, it's just how it is. But John did. He, huh. spent as, he spent as much time asking me about my life as I did his. And obviously, my life wouldn't be very interesting reading so it didn't make it in the book but I, th I think I think it's reflective of the kind of man he was that he actually cared about what I thought and what I felt about things and you know if he, he described a situation in his life he would say have you ever experienced anything like this and in fact one instance did get into it because he was talking about bereavement and he asked me if I'd ever lost anyone close to me and I said well actually I have lost my father I I mean what kind of a person does that that isn't deeply empathetic? Uh, and that, that that's what I left the whole project thinking. I just had huge respect for John's empathy. Yeah, so I, I want to touch on both of those because the, the, the last thing you said there I think is so critical to people who live at that higher vibration in terms of how you relate to and appreciate people because you can't live your life as a beautiful dance, as a, as, a, as a song, as music, if you can't listen to your own soul, if yeah. you can't have that empathy for yourself. And when a person who has that extreme empathy for themselves, because what that means is it's an appreciation for the human will, and the one that you are closest to, the one that is your own, you want to see expressed in the world. You want to see that alive. And if you don't have that relationship to yourself, you can't have that relationship with other people. And people who have that deep, rich relationship with themselves and therefore live as, as a shining light, as a song that we want to hear, like with John's life, it, it, it's driven by that empathy, that connection, that appreciation for the human soul itself in a way that speaks through how they then live. But I want to, I want to like completely disagree with you on, the, on your, your narrative, your understanding of that moment in John's life and suggest a completely different narrative. And then you see if, if, if this rings true for you. Okay. But I, I never, again, I was working with John as a colleague, as an activist, as my running mate during a certain period of that time that, that he was on the run. And maybe it was biased in my experience by we have the chance to win the Libertarian Party nomination. We have the chance to take your message, John, of, 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 of tax evasion and, and everything that you've done in righteous activism and living differently since you, you, you know, sold or cashed out of, of, of McAfee, the, the corporation, and, and, and have, have gone on this epic life journey. We have the chance to use your story as an example, to run you know, in, in absentia almost, or run in, in exile for vice president. I mean, it was, it was it was an epic, positive undertaking. And in a sense, when I listen to the tapes, yeah, it has that profound impact for me now in hindsight that he's not with us. But I think he was setting the stage for a comeback. I don't think he was, I don't think he was, 
saying, all right, this is it. He wanted to be understood so that he could come back, that if he was, if, however his journey ended. I, I think what he wanted to do was to, to tell his case in the court of public opinion before the government had a chance to, if it, it played out as he got captured and extradited, as I think might have happened. And, and, you know, we've talked about this on the show a lot, but the reason, and this last thing I'll say on this narrative, that, that the reason they had to murder him is that John McAfee on the loose in the United States, even if it's because he's in a jail cell, but he's in the United States, and he's got Mark, a credible third party, is an author telling his story. They couldn't allow that. Yeah. He would have been real. He, he, he would have been in this. I, I want your take on this in the bigger sense because you're outside of the United States and you're outside of politics and you're outside of libertarianism. Mm -hmm. But I go, oh my God, John McAfee is this beautiful destabilizing force to the evil empire of the American political system. Yeah, hundred um, percent. No, listen. I take on board your your insight. I mean, you you had dealings with them uh, on the level that I didn't have, and I'll always listen to someone else's viewpoint. You could be right about that. I mean, he did say to me that, you know, arguably he could do more in his position of in hiding as he could have done when he was back in the U.S. I mean, in hiding, he argued that he could talk to journalists, he could do interviews, he could go on podcasts, he could talk to me. He could prod the hornet's nest in an even more effective way from a distance mm -hmm. as he could do up close. So, yeah. you, know, you know, I I I give some credence to what you were saying. Whether whether it was to set up a comeback or not, I don't know. But I would certainly go as far as to say that he didn't ever envisage that he wouldn't be around to see this book come out. Because I mean, I, I had dialogue directly with him and also via Janice, where he said. You know, we yeah. can't wait. We can't wait for this to come out because we're going to promote it. We're going to back it, and all this kind of stuff. So, yeah, I, I take your point. You, you you do make a good observation there, and you could you could very well be onto something. So, speaking of Janice, uh, what's your take on what she's doing right now, pursuing the Spanish government and ruling on McAfee's death and uh, the, the issues around custody of the body? Really complicated. Uh, and uh, I say this with great respect to anyone else involved, but I have heard from John's daughter and she doesn't like the fact that the book exists. And that's fine. I mean, she, she's entitled to her opinion on it. She didn't like the 47 biological children comment. And I think in her mind, she thinks I said that. And, you know, that's something John said. Uh, no, yeah. listen. I, I understand her her position. It can't be easy being the daughter of uh, a guy like John McAfee. But you know, to to kind of take it out on me because the the book wasn't a big win for her emotionally. Uh, I think is perhaps the wrong way to go about it. But l let's leave that. Janice's position, I don't understand. Uh, I saw, like everybody else saw, the the post she put on Instagram and Twitter. I think it was around Christmas time where she kind of implied that her situation wasn't something she controlled. Uh, I can't remember her exact terminology, but it was like, you know, I'm being kind of forced to stay here. Uh, and I believe that certain people don't want me to leave. That was quite cryptic for to me. And I don't really know what it means. And I still don't. Any dialogue I have had with her has been friendly. It has been infrequent. She said, you know, great stuff for the book, uh, anything I can do to promote it, et cetera, I will, and she has done. In terms of what she is actually doing in Spain and where she is in Spain, I do not know. What I do know, and I spoke to a journalist who's who works in Spain, he actually works for a, U a UK newspaper, and the Spanish lawyers are saying nothing, and they've basically said nothing since day one. They've been impossible. The Spanish court have to say something. And the situation, as I understand it at the moment, is his body is still where it was. And there is going to be a hearing. It was originally intended to be in uh, March or April to even discuss whether the possibility of another autopsy is 
something that's even going to fly. That's not even a certainty at, that, at this point. There still needs to be another hearing to decide whether they can have a hearing on that. Now, there's not even a date for that first thing. So, I mean, we could we could easily be in the situation where we're a year down the line from his death and nothing is resolved. Now, you, you tell me, is, that, is there anything normal about that? <laughs> yeah, in America. <laughs> uh, well, you know, Mark. Before we before we get on to your, your exploits as a as a music writer, uh, I, I mean, what what does that tell you? I mean, should it, should there be a massive fucking Streisand effect with this when the government says? Don't look at people like John McAfee. I mean, I, I, you think about, oh, like, what's, what's that epic speech where they go, and then, and then they kill people like that. Or is it, is it like the great dictator speech, you know? You know yeah. they, they, anybody who, they, who really has that potential to challenge the powers that be by waking people up, by challenging us, the masses, to uh, overthrow the yoke, end up getting killed. You know, do you put John in, in, in a category like that? And, and what is it then that you would hope people get from your book? Well, listen, I, I don't actually put him in that category. And I'll tell you why, because the, the dead man switch theory, which I've avoided, has come yeah. to nothing. It's come to nothing. As far as I know, it's come to nothing. Uh, and I have to say, I never thought it would. Now, Remove that, and what you're left with, you're left with somebody that says you don't have to pay tax, and you know, if you want to go and use cryptocurrency as a as a means of not doing it, go ahead and do it. But let's be honest, John is hardly the first to have said that, and he definitely won't be the last. Is that a reason why this guy's body should still not be returned you, to the US? Uh, uh, hold on, I got, before we finish that. I, I got to I got to interrupt and say no. John McAfee was the first who was a tech mogul, multimillionaire who had that credibility of an undeniable household name. Fair enough. Do you think it, do you think it matters though? I mean, at that point, I mean, a lot of people didn't even know that. I I would say that a lot of people who were listening to John talk about cryptocurrency probably didn't have much of a clue that he even was involved in antivirus back at the beginning. A lot of these people would have, a few of them, a lot of these people would have been people that picked him up in Belize and thought, this guy's just a nut, and I just absolutely love this whole life. This guy, you know, going around on a yacht and all this kind of thing. I think a lot of people bought into that whole maverick thing without really focusing on the tech stuff. I think you discount, though, the, the fundamental credibility of the undeniable resume point that he carries with him. Even if it's reduced to one sentence, he was the guy behind McAfee antivirus, and then he sold out his share and went on this epic adventure of his own. Like, and, and now he's here wherever you're meeting him. Even if it's reduced to that, I think I'll, that I'll give you. the entree, and and I and maybe this is more in, in you know I, you're you're maybe more of an inherent free thinker, but for American politics, it was a big point for him in in, in running you know in sort of having his foot in the door even with the Libertarian Party yep. before he before he was a Libertarian in in precise philosophical thought, and I I'll remind people I. I take significant credit for that because he read my book. Whereas before that, he you know he was talking about, and this is in his 2016 race when he ran with our friend Ted Weiss. Uh, he started this campaign saying, "I'm going to be the best tech security president. I know more about cybersecurity than any other candidate by far, and therefore we'll leave the U.S. government and keeping America cyber secure." And then he read my book and was like. Never mind. I'm going to use my expertise to get hands off completely as government when it comes to technology. Um, and and uh, that, but but seeing how I could use him as a running mate to bolster my credibility because he's the guy who made 100 million dollars creating the thing of coronavirus. Yeah. And I got to give you credit in in your book because I didn't know that much of the details of the backstory, but hearing it in, in no domain, 
um, actually gave me a good appreciation for that. But sorry, I want to go back to you to give you the, 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 the thought on this uh, before we get to talking a little bit about music and giving Joey a chance to pick your brain here. Um, what do you want people to learn from John McAfee's story and life in your book? Yeah, I mean, it's the same as what it was at the beginning for me. And it was always the sense that you 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 can live a life that isn't guided by convention by what you know you, you know the standard jobs the stuff i mean this is offset slightly because i've said this a couple of times and people have shot me down and i'll i'll, I'll take it again if that's where you're going it is a lot easier it's a lot easier to to live the kind of life that john lived with money and I think I've said before that if most people tried to live the kind of life you lived, you'd be homeless in 24 hours, if not 48, 48 hours. But I don't think it matters. That part of it doesn't matter. What what matters is to to have the willingness to to walk away from what is considered normal, and the the willingness to think about life in a different way. And th these sound like really vague concepts. I get that, but that's what it, that's what appealed to me. And when I left the book. Uh, and left the conversations with John, it made me apply a, a completely different mindset to my own life. You know, the kind of stuff that I used to take sort of really seriously uh, or or kind of kind of stress about, I kind of stopped stressing about. Because one of the things John said to me in a conversation that really stuck with me was, if you can't get over a minor disagreement with a colleague, a family member, even your wife, in five seconds, you, you are lost because in the scheme of life, it is so inconsequential. And, you know, it's it's easy to say these kind of things, but it's very difficult to actually do them. But when I walked away from the project with John, I really have tried to do that with things. And it actually works. It, it gives you a certain type of freedom that I did not have before I met John. And, you know, when somebody sends me an email chasing me for, a deadline or you know there's this edit is meant to be in by such and such a day it, it before i used to sort of jump on that and say okay i'll i'll, I'll deal with it to, to today or I, I feel like you know i should really respond or or so, go crawling to these people i just don't do that anymore it's basically i'll do it when i'm going to do it and if if you don't like that what are you ultimately going to do about it and i think when you start thinking like that you're you're in a whole different sphere of living and the book is full of that I mean, you you talked about his early life and how much you didn't know about it. it, it I mean, the stuff pre-McAfee to me was the most interesting stuff. This guy was going to companies and basically slapping sort of page-long documents on the desk on day one saying, here's your program. And by the way, I'll never work from the office. And if you need me, I'll come every second Friday. And these people just did it. And he just disappeared in Rio or wherever it was in Munich and lived in a house with homeless people or in Munich, in Rio, sort of, you know, wandering around in the carnival while he's meant to be meant to be working. I, I just think that that mindset is just so magical. And as I said at the beginning, tough to employ in the real world, particularly at the moment. But just if you can get that mindset of, yeah, we've only, we've only got one life, you know, let, let's live it. Uh, without boundaries and without limitations, that would be in a very long-winded way what I would take out of it. All right, yeah, no, Mark, that's a beautiful point, and and I I want to back that up, but I I, I also want to suggest a slight reframing there because you say it's not easier. You need you, know, you need to start with a hundred million dollars, and obviously for certain specific things that John McAfee pulled off, yeah, you need that. But when you say it's harder, I didn't stay in, on the hamster wheel is harder. Uh, you know, and I think for you, you should appreciate how much for yourself as an author, you've led a fundamental life of entrepreneurship the same way that John did. And that, that's really the critical difference. And it's a lot easier than letting other people dictate your life. And it's a better way to live. And I think, I think John McAfee showed that beautifully. And, 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 and yeah, I want to, I want to tell people something that, that you, you touched on there that's well captured in the book that a lot of people don't know about John is that prior to McAfee Associates, what he did was a type of high tech consulting work where he would go and is that, is that, is that unfair? No, but, it's spot on. 
Yeah, but what he would do was so, he was so hyper capable. He found these leverage points where he realized that remaking companies, he could do so efficiently. He could produce above and beyond what people expected him to be able to produce on an hourly basis. They could come into the office once a week and still sustain these relationships with companies where he justified his massive compensation and was able to go around as a sort of, I mean, a gun for, you know, hired tech consultation guru who could, who could remake companies and walk away with, with hundreds of thousands of dollars, millions of dollars at a time like it was no big deal. Um, but but the, 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 the lesson there isn't, oh, you have to be some crazy, you know, above and beyond tech genius to pull that off. You just have to find your niche. You have to define your lifestyle to what's appropriate and, and, and find what's really high value for you, mm -hmm. not what's high value for some, some, somebody who wants to make you a cog in their machine. Mm -hmm. Now, Mark, before we, before we get uh, Joey on screen here, we have one comment, uh, question from the audience from uh, Clyde Ride. And, and, and this is the first time I'm hearing about this. Is there a movie deal for No Domain? Clyde Wright says, when it's appropriate, I have a question for Mark. How much direction and hands-on will you have on the AMD, AMDC Films production? So, oh, light us up, Mark. What, it, it, what's, the, what's the deal here? Yeah, so uh, in, the, in the months after the, the first interviews I did, one of which was with you when John died in June, uh, there was a lot of interest. I had a lot of film people coming to me saying, can we option the book? Can we option the tapes? Can we option your ass? What can we option? And uh, <laughs> these people came with different approaches. There was kind of hippie type guys who were wanting to do something kind of arty. That was cool. Amanda Milius, who ended up uh, acquiring the rights, is John Milius of Apocalypse Now, uh, fame's daughter. And she is a big fan of strong men figures. And she got the McAfee mystique very quickly. And I felt she was the right person to do this. So she acquired the rights to the book and the tapes. And she has an option to make a documentary if she wishes, and also a scripted movie. Uh, personally, I think both will happen. Uh, I think there's scope for both in terms of, uh, I, I mean, completely off, well, not off the record, actually, I'm going to tell you, I think a scripted movie would be fantastic because yeah. I think it would give the kind of, you, you need a lot of creative license with McAfee. And I think a movie kind of gives you that. A documentary, you're tied to the facts. Granted, with McAfee, it's not certain what the facts are, but you're still tied to some facts. Whereas I think the scripted thing would be awesome. And I think if they got the right person, Robert Downey Jr., somebody like that, if he's listening you know <laughs> there's a job here for you no, no yeah. I, I think it would be yeah. great uh so that's ongoing will i have input well i've got consultancy built into it and i think that will probably be merely to offer guidance in terms of what's in the tapes any queries on the actual book itself, any background that they can't find, I'll, I'll be very happy to do that. In terms of having any sort of direct input as to what it's going to look like, that's not my domain. All right, well, if any of the producers are listening, let me tell you, I hope that you make sure Mark is involved to capture the music of yeah. John's life for the project. And with that, let's get Joey on screen here. Um, Joey had some questions she wanted to ask specifically about some of your music writing. So Joey, you know, ahead. I feel like you answered them all though. Like I like I saw that you write so much about metal. You're a metalhead. I grew up in a pit myself, so I love it. I got goosebumps when you said you're a metalhead and always will be. It. It's a lifestyle. It's it's liberating well, in and of itself. And Maccabees luck really was. Really fucking metal. Yeah. And, and, and really encompassed. <laughs> That spirit. So it sounds like that's something that, that you know maybe that, that that inspires your writing is just getting across that that feeling of liberation and people who have lived it in their own ways, be it on stage or the way McAfee did. 
Yeah, yeah there, there's there's a couple of parts to that, and this is something I talk about with people who don't get heavy metal, and there's a lot of them, and it always really surprises me because people who don't understand heavy metal don't even know it exists. You know, I meet people who, I mean, in my sort of previous life when I when I was on the hamster wheel, and I'm talking 20 years ago, I used to go to dinner parties. And in those days, I was listening to Cannibal Corpse. I was listening to all kinds of things like that. You know, people would say to you, oh, so, you know, what kind of thing are you into? And you, you, you'd you mention a word like that. And you cannot even understand. Yeah. Yeah. You can't, under, you can't yeah. even understand how unfathomable that world is to these people. And I love that because... Heavy metal is like, it feels like you're in a club and it's all of your own and everybody within that club completely gets it. And to me, that's always been a source of great security because when I was a teenager and we were all doing the same thing, you know, our whole lives revolved around going to the local record store, picking up vinyl albums of metal bands. Our whole community and our whole reason for existing was centered around heavy metal. Everything else yeah. was secondary. You know, studies at school, social yeah. life, forget it. Everything was heavy metal. Everything else came second. And I still live like that. And I've somehow managed to become a sort of functioning adult. I've had two children who are now who are now adults themselves. I you know, I'm here and I'm and I'm and I'm doing as you said earlier, uh, Adam, a job that is free form that is allowing me to yeah it's allowing me to to yeah. pick and choose when i do what i want to do and uh, who i want to do it with and to me that's part of that sort of whole community existence that heavy metal gives to me and the two go absolutely hand in hand do i want to continue writing books about heavy metal maybe not i, I mean there there's a couple more coming if if if, if the right people come along i'll do them but it will never, ever leave my uh, – there isn't a second that goes by each day that I don't think about heavy metal in some capacity. So uh, if you can relate to that in any way, good on you. Yeah, it is. It's a life set. And me too. I, I, felt, I felt safer at a heavy metal show, parking lot, waiting in line for the tickets, whatever. Because there, was a whole, there was a whole thing around even going to the concerts, right? Yeah. Just waiting in line for the tickets. Calling in the Ticketmaster if you could. I don't know what your equivalent is over there, but you know, meeting up with your friends and like making sure you're there to park. And I felt safer there than anywhere in my life as as a teenager. And thank goodness my parents understood that I felt safe, so they never held that from me. Yeah, yeah. you're absolutely right. I mean, people say to me, "Oh, these concerts must be really dangerous. There must be a chance of getting beaten up." And I say, "That's the last place you'll ever get beaten up." And if you did get beaten up, somebody would pick you off the floor and pick you up again. That's exactly. the thing. It, it's that community thing. So, yeah, I mean, you know, that's just my life. And it always will be. And, you know, th there obviously is a sort of tie into the kind of McAfee life and that kind of thing that probably, you know, subconsciously drew me to that kind of thing. And uh, John didn't like heavy metal. We discussed it. He hated it. Yeah. And that's fine. I just said you're too old. And he said, problem. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, I think he got that. I was passionate about it. So, uh, yeah, th these things are all part of the same kind of mindset for me. That's awesome. I'm, I'm excited. I, I didn't realize you wrote uh, all the books you did on the uh, Pantera. Uh, Nergal of Behemoth. Oh. I did K.K. Downey and Judas Priest. I did Brian Slagle, who's the CEO of Metal Blade Records. I'm doing yeah. another book with him in a, in a year that comes out next year. I mean, I, I can't, I'll take any amount of that stuff. I just, I mean, I could try to explain it to people. People who I was in school with say, you know, what, do, what is it you do now type of thing? You seem to write about sort of metal people sometimes. I'm like, yeah, that's exactly what I do. And that's exactly what I was into at school. And I'm still doing it what are you doing? And I'm looking at somebody who's massively overweight, probably divorced, very unhappy, working for somebody thinking, actually, this guy's got a point. He's, he's living, he's living a life that is, is he's passionate about. So that's where I'm at. Yeah, exactly. I've got one more thing to tell you both. And this is, uh, I'm not a Bitcoin guy at all. I'm a boomer from when it comes to that. And, but I am rock and roll, 
And when these yeah. guys, are, when these guys at Canonic came to me and said, Do you, "Are you familiar with Canonic?" Can't say that I am. Canonic are guys in Austin who are a self-publishing platform, uh, and they publish on Bitcoin. And they came to me and said, "Let's do a special edition on Bitcoin of the McAfee book." What more? What life was more piratical than John McAfee? And what is more piratical? versus the the main publishers than publishing in bitcoin and i said yeah. i agree with all i agree with all of you so we've got the special edition coming out in the next few days super limited super luxury hardcover with signature with numbers it will be sumptuous with a holographic cover in addition it will be mirrored as an nft on bitcoin uh, which will be very cool that people can trade and also will be a signal. You will hold that thing up and say, I'm in this world. So that's, you know, I'm not saying I know everything about Bitcoin. I'm not saying I know everything about crypto, but I'll tell you what, I'm, I'm down for an adventure and this is certainly one of them. So uh, anyone who's interested in that kind of thing, keep a lookout for it. John would approve. Yeah. Well, that was part of it. I mean, I'm sure he would have approved and uh Anything I can do here here on that, that that kind of honors what he believed in in combination of what we did together, I will continue to do. Well, speaking of which, what you said projects in the works. What's in the works? Oh man. Well, okay. There there is one. Uh it's a heavy metal musician. Uh it's it's a book that's actually been sitting for since 2015. And it's you might know the, the band Queensryche. Jeff Tate was the lead Aww. singer in Queensryche. Big band in the 80s and 90s. Had a big meltdown in the sort of late 2000s. But absolutely iconic band. Jeff's a friend of mine. He said to me many years ago, Let, let's do this autobiography. So it's in the works. It'll be finished tomorrow if I get off this call. And uh, it'll be published later this year. Then the other book I've got in the works uh, is in... U.S. politics and is a biography of Steve Bannon. Mm. Very cool. Mm. Authorized by Steve Bannon and with input directly from Steve Bannon. Do you have a goal in mind with the Steve Bannon book? The way you, you described the, the objective, or this is like just explorers or just like this is going to be powerful one way or another? Uh, well, in the same way as I'm fascinated as I was fascinated by John, I'm equally fascinated by Steve uh, for entirely different reasons. Uh, but but there are similarities. I think if you ask the guy in the street, what do you know about Steve Bannon? It's okay, Trump's campaign manager, right? The war room, maybe. Do they know about Steve Bannon in China? Do they know about Steve Bannon at Goldman Sachs? Do they know about Steve Bannon in the Navy? Do they know about Steve Bannon making movies? Nobody knows any of these things. And I need to understand, and Steve knows that I need to understand what made him the man he is now mm. uh, and what goes along with that nationalist, populist <clears throat> movement that is so motivating for him. Uh, I need to understand what the mindset behind that is. Now, this can't be sycophantic, as I don't think my book with John was, because uh, I think if you're sycophantic in a book like this, it has no credibility. People just say you're in the guy's pocket, forget it, you know, waste of time. It will not be like that with Steve. I will be talking to people who do not like Steve Bannon and have really good reason to hate Steve Bannon. In addition, I'll be talking to people who've worked with Steve and to uh, try and get a sense of who this man is. And it's really just a demystification process. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, I think it will be of great interest to people. Certainly yeah, the, the kind of inside baseball I will get. There, there's a great word, demystification, for the way I said it's an ex exploration and as an open goal, just going into a project like that, undeniably Steve Bannon is a critical, and I don't want to say misunderstood, but uh, under-understood character in modern American politics who, yeah. who deserves uh, examination. 
at this point. So I'm I'm excited to see what what comes out of that. Yeah. So that's that's ongoing at the moment. And uh, anything else that comes along in the next few months, uh, let's wait and see. I think our friend Ed would like that book. I I, I remember him listening to the War Room quite frequently. Yeah. In the morning. Yeah. Before, so. Well, yeah. I'd be interested. What are you, what are your 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 two views on Steve and that whole world? Because let's be honest, the war room is a parallel universe in some respects. Well, uh, my I, I, I would be just to be raw, self-interested ideologue in this. Uh, I would say that Steve Bannon, as a creature parallel to Trump, has gotten a lot of people who otherwise wouldn't be motivated and inspired in politics, but with a lot of misconceptions, a lot of bullshit, but a strong passion for principles that I would share of freedom and justice and, and ethics and anti-authoritarianism and decentralization. Yeah. And, and I would hope that your exposition would, would lead a lot of conservative Bannon fans to, to turn libertarian, or at least to, to get to that next level of political awareness. Yeah. No, no. I mean, that is something that's on my mind. I mean, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be uh, qualified enough to call myself a libertarian, but I certainly have libertarian views, uh, as as I also have lots of other views. But. I do know what you're coming from with Steve. And I think a lot of people jump to conclusions when it comes to him, particularly when you mention the word nationalist and populist, people make an automatic jump to racism, which isn't necessarily a clear progression when you actually analyze the facts. And I think it's those sort of gray areas that I'd like to explore because these are very gray areas. The, the, the people that attach themselves to these kind of movements aren't necessarily the people who are at the forefront of them. A lot of people look at these movements and think, okay, here's a vehicle for whatever crank stuff I'm doing. I can maybe progress it a little bit on the coattails of this, whereas the actual movement itself isn't necessarily of that ideology. That's that's the way I think at the moment. It might all change in a few months, and I'll be coming on your show telling you something <laughs> completely different in six months, but we'll see. Uh, either way, Either way, it doesn't matter. What matters is that that's what I'm doing. And I will continue to sit in this room and I'll be able to continue doing this uh, great job that I'm doing uh, as long as people are willing to have me on board to do it. So I'm, I'm so grateful for that. Awesome. Well, Mark, you and I connect on Twitter and um, I, I want, I, uh, I don't have your handle. What, so what's, what, but what's the best way for people to connect with you? Yeah, just Twitter, and that's just my name, at Mark Eglinton, E-G-L-I-N-T-O-N, -N, all one word. Uh, anything that I'm doing in terms of other books, uh, mostly I'll tweet about there. Anything that I'm promoting that, to do with John, any insight I have on John in terms of what's happening with the case, uh, I'll try and put it on there. And, you know, I like to think that my Twitter is a sort of reasonably open stream of consciousness, not sort of controlled by anyone keeping me on a hamster wheel of any kind. So uh, I hope that's attractive to people. And there's a bit of metal in there as well. So a bit of heavy metal. So what else do you want? All right. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, Mark. We look forward to hearing from you again and all your future work. Really appreciate it. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you, Mark.